Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, and thank you all for being here for the first a clergy-led Lenten series on life's U-turns, life's U-turns. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start our time off with us praying, and we're going to pray together through Psalm 121 from the Book of Common Prayer. So you'll find, um, I pulled it up on the screens here from uh, the BCP online, and I, I would like for us to say together, and I'll share why this psalm was important or is important in my life. Let's do Psalm 121 together. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over Israel fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Amen. So this was one of the first psalms that my grandmother taught me to memorize. And my grandmother is this very godly, devout Lutheran. English is not her first language. Uh, when she speaks English, nobody really understands what she's saying. Okay? But she has this daily habit of where she will pull out the Psalter from her language of the Bible, and she, every day she'll pull out pieces of paper and she'll write out each psalm. She'll write out each psalm. And she'll go through, I don't know, through, I mean, she's 90-something years old. She's still alive. And she's been doing this as, far, as long as I can remember, and I'm 37 years old. So I don't know how many millions of pieces of paper and how many drops of ink she has used to write out the psalms. And one of the first psalms, so she, uh, like I mentioned, she doesn't speak English very well, but she has this psalm memorized in English for whatever reason. And she, she, uh, when I was around six years old, uh, at VBS, there was this, at uh, the church that I grew up in, and I'll share some pictures, at the church that I grew up in, there were these memorization competitions, and I was kind of like this, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a, meant to be priest, let's put it that way, when I was six years old, okay? Um, I was a bit of a, a little mischievous little guy, and I was at VBS, and they had this Bible memorization competition, and, you know, I was, I was too cool to participate in it. And towards the end, when they had the competition, my grandmother was absolutely inflamed that I had not memorized a single thing at VBS. And so she made me sit down. After VBS was done, it was the summer break, she made, she made me memorize Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills from where will my help come from. And without me knowing it, what she was doing was that she was sowing seed in my heart for God to use later on in my life. So I want to show you a few pictures, and, and, and hopefully this will uh, bring out the story that I'm trying to share here of how the Lord took my life and created a whole bunch of U-turns. Uh, this is the most recent picture we have from our family. It is from when Naomi got ordained to the priesthood. This was earlier in January of this year. And there's, uh, she's holding our youngest, Elijah, who looks stunned and surprised for whatever reason. <laughs> and then uh, we have Emma, and that is her mischievous smile. That is her mischievous smile. And then, and then there's Daniel. Daniel is your quintessential oldest responsible kid who is always trying to do the right thing. And uh, it looks like Naomi is turning away from me. Uh, she's not. I had to crop the picture. She's actually facing the bishop that ordained her. Uh, but we cropped the picture for whatever reason. Um, and so it looks like she's turning away from me. <laughs> now, if you asked this little guy, so that's a picture of my brother and I. My dad sent me, uh, took a photo of this and sent it to me. And I, 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 it's in my house. Uh, and so the, the taller guy is my older brother. He's three and a half years older than I am. And then the, 
guy with a half tucked shirt is me. We were both uh, page boys at a, at a cousin's wedding. And so that's why we both were dressed alike. And you can see my brother was, once again, the quintessential older responsible kid, has a shirt tucked in, and then there's me with my runners and my shirt half tucked out because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. And if you, so if you ask this little guy, um, where do you think you'll be 30 years from now? The answer would not be this, okay? The answer would not be married, a priest, married to a priest with three amazing little kids serving in Houston. None of those things that have come up in any of the answers. In fact, but the first thing I wanted to be when I was growing up was I wanted to join the army. And I told my dad that, and he was like, that's dumb. Do not do that. And then I had a really cool uncle who was uh, an aeronautical engineer, and he worked on uh, when, uh, the, the, the Concorde planes. You all remember that? Yeah, for British Airways. He used to work on those. Uh, and, and so I used to look up to that. I thought, maybe I'll become an aeronautical engineer one day. And I did one of these aptitude tests in high school, and it said, uh, when you are ready to enter the job market, aeronautical engineers will not be the most high paying job. And I was like, well, I mean, I guess I won't be doing that anymore. So I landed on, well, what is a good high paying job? I came up with lawyer. And also because, you know, my mother would often tell me sometimes, oh, maybe you should just become a lawyer. And she didn't mean that as a compliment. <laughs> it's because I kept getting into these arguments and stuff with her. And, um, and, but I, I took it as a compliment. And, and so uh, I actually thought I was going to be a lawyer for a while. And then uh, eventually, my, my dad really wanted me to be a doctor. And so that's, where, that's really what uh, I ended up planning on doing. But during all this time, like if you ask this little guy exactly what he was planning on doing with his life, priest was not even in the top 100 of answers. Okay? But I grew up in this church, and this church is in a city called Chennai or Madras in India. And it's, uh, it was built in 1821. And it was a very strong, it still is, a very strong Christian community. It's part of the Anglican communion. And this church was built by the British for the Scottish soldiers, the Scottish garrison that lived in that city. And it's called St. Andrew's Kirk, Kirk being Scottish for church. And so this is a church that I grew up in. This is the church I was baptized in. This is the church I went to VBS in. And I didn't learn much, as it turns out. And this is uh, inside of the church. And you can see this uh, blue dome. The picture, this picture doesn't do a lot of justice. But that blue dome actually captures the constellations that one would see if they would look up in the night sky in that part of the world. But it's an amazing community. They have an average Sunday attendance of about uh, 2,500 or so. And the reason for that is because uh, the part of India that I come from, Chennai has a population of 22 million. And around 10% of the population are Christians. And you know, if you do the math, that's a, that's, we're talking about a lot of Christians. And so the church that I grew up in had a Sunday attendance. At that time, it wasn't quite 2,200, but now it's around 2,200. And it was an in incredibly faithful, very biblically literate community. And this is where I went to VBS. How many of you all are in Bible Study Fellowship or have heard of Bible Study Fellowship? And there's a few hands in the room. And so my Sunday school teacher was a Bible Study Fellowship leader, and uh, Mr. Abraham. And Mr. Abraham was a wonderful teacher who, who taught us little guys who weren't interested in being there. We just wanted the snacks. Uh, he taught us to read and understand the Bible, even if it meant that we really did not fully get what we were reading at that time. But his whole thing was, you guys are kids, you'll get this. My job is just to impart the word to you and be faithful, a faithful steward of the word to you. But over a season of time, what ended up happening was that there, was, uh, there were multiple waves of emigration from India where multiple waves of Indians would leave India and immigrate to uh, the four main um, countries were Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, and America. And so a lot of my relatives ended up leaving to one of these places. And we were the only ones, my family were the only ones who ended up in Canada. 
And when we were in Canada, we ended up going to this little uh, small suburban parish called St. Cuthbert's. And how we ended up there was we, we visited, we landed in Vancouver on December the 13th, 1998. We visited a bunch of churches and St. Cuthbert's had a rector and this rector was the only one who came and visited us, right? He was this old school parish priest and his whole thing was, I'm gonna do my door-to-door -door visits and visit my parishioners. So he showed up in our house, had coffee with us and my dad was like, well, no one else, we visited all these churches but no one else visited us except this guy. And so we ended up going there, and that's where I ended up going to, to youth group and student ministry. This is a, a picture from one of their Advent services. And this is a picture from their most recent Easter service. Uh, you can see people coming and putting up flowers on the cross. But once again, this is an incredibly faithful community. And when I was in this community, this is when I actually experienced a conversion, like a, a personal conversion in my faith. What had happened was that when we immigrated to Vancouver, I ended up not having friends for a while. And then when I did end up having friends, it was the wrong kind of friends. Because I was, I was a mischievous guy growing up. And so I was drawn to the troublemakers. And some of these troublemakers, they really were troublemakers. You know, it was a lot of, um, you know, skipping classes and, 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 and uh, teenage substance abuse type stuff and teenage parties and all of these different things. And, but I had straight A's throughout the entire time. And so what my parents did not know was that their son had all these straight A's because that's all they could see. But he had like this incredibly, what I would look back as an incredibly unhealthy and unholy life even though I went to church. And, 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 and over time, I didn't even realize that, but over time, I was accumulating, a sea, uh, I was accumulating many different uh, levels of guilt and regret. But I was also having fun. <laughs> and the fun outweighed the guilt and the regret. Eventually, until the Lord said, that's enough. You're done. And so it, it all happened quite suddenly. Do you all, can you all recognize this picture? Do, I, why don't you all try to take a guess of what's going on in this picture? So the person with a big halo around his head, standing, that's Jesus, right? He's standing on the water. Yeah. That's Peter, right? And Peter really when you read that gospel story, it's Peter's actually drowning in the water, right? Peter tries to get out of the boat, walk in the water. He starts drowning, and Jesus picks him up. Now, that, so, that story is captured in a, a familiar hymn that I think many of us might know. I'm going to sing it out, okay? Forgive my singing voice. Just listen to the words. I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea held out his helping hand. From the waters lifted me, now safe I am. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. You all familiar with that? Some of us, yeah, some, yeah it's, it's a beautiful song. And I heard that song, I hadn't heard it in such a long time, and I heard that song for the first time, and I realized, I am that sinner sinking deep in sin. And I have no one to help me. I had, I had this picture of, of just dropping in an ocean. I, I also, by the way, I can't swim, okay, in real life. Like, you know, I almost drowned on my honeymoon. So 
Um, that's a story for another day. But I, I can't swim, so I find the, I find the water kind of scary sometimes. If I, if I can't see the bottom, I'm not getting in there. Um, so to, to actually hear this song, and then I picture myself sinking deep in sin, I was at that moment convicted that finally all the regrets and the guilt and the shame had just caught up to me. And it outweighed all the fun that I was having. But the neat thing about that song is that it, just, it, do, it doesn't just talk about sinking in sin. It also talks about Jesus lifting us up out of our sin. And for the first time, all that seed that was sown throughout all those many years of VBS and Sunday school and all of those things, it, it, like, you know, I thought it was kind of is going in one year, coming out the other. I thought I was rejecting it. But really, that's not what happened at all. Somehow, God, through his grace and mercy, caused all of that seed to explode in fruit when I heard that song. And that drastically changed my life. In fact, I would hang out with my friends that weekend, and they started calling me a sourpuss. Because I was there with them, but I was just like, yeah, not, not today, guys. I got I to gotta go home so I could go to church tomorrow morning. Right, and, and, and that slowly started a journey of me becoming reacquainted with my faith. My prayer life became much bigger than what it was. I was reading the Bible for the first time and understanding what I was reading. I, would, I basically went through the whole Bible in about six months and kept doing it over and over and over again. And when I showed up to this little uh, suburban parish, St. Cuthbert's, there were some very wise older mentors who saw me and they said, Something's happened in John's life, and we want to nurture that. And so they would take me for coffee. They would, t they, they would uh, uh, sponsor me to go on these different youth retreats and things like that just because they saw something in my life, and they said, something has happened in John's life. He obviously loves the Lord. He understands the gospel. We need to nurture that. And so over time, while I was in, in, in undergrad, I realized, well, maybe I want to go to med school because... If I'm a doctor, I can really help people. Like God has done something in my life. And, and what I want to do is I want to give that back to the Lord and I want to help people and become a doctor. Obviously, that didn't happen. Right? I stand in front of you not as a doctor. So what changed? So uh, around the time that I was in college, well, let me change that picture for later. Around the, around the time that I was in college, I, I got involved with a really neat because I really wanted to understand the Bible, I got involved with a really neat college ministry called Crew. And when I was on Crew, I, they had some of the best Bible studies I'd ever come across, and I was, I was just gobbling it all up. And on one, of these, uh, one of these Bible studies, our Bible study leader, he asked me, hey, John, listen, we are sending one of our first mission trips to this closed Muslim country where no, you know, the entire country has a third of the number of Christians that St. Martin's has as membership, to give you some perspective, entire country. And he said, we're sending a, a small group of, uh, of uh, student leaders who love the Lord, uh, who are interested in doing this sort of thing. Would you be interested? And I said, sign me up. I don't have anything else going on in the summer. And so I went on this trip. And it's, it's, if, if you've ever been on a mission trip, it's a, it's a life-transforming experience. All you do is you wake up, you pray with other Christians, you, you serve the Lord, you come back, you pray with other Christians, and you keep doing that for many days. It's the best kind of Christian community, and you're using all the gifts that God has given you to bless other people. So I was, uh, I was at this trip, and I, in my mind, I'm still going to med school. And then there's a good buddy of mine. And, and here's this picture. There's a good, there was a good buddy of mine on that trip who was also supposed to go to med school. And so one night, after doing a lot of missionary work, late at night, we're all exhausted. We finish our, our, our team prayer time. Ronnie is his name. He comes into my room, and he says, hey, John, do you really think that God's calling you to med school? And I said, you know, Ronnie, I actually don't know. And turns out Ronnie was also planning on going to med school. And so Ronnie tells me, well, you know, I thought I was supposed to go to med school too, but I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so Ronnie and I said, well, why don't we pray for each other? 
Ronnie, I'll pray for you and you pray for me. And so Ronnie, we both prayed for each other. We said, Lord, we don't know what your plans are for our lives, but these are our plans. Have you ever heard that statement, you know, if you want to make God laugh, show him your plans? <laughs> you all heard that before? Okay. So I think that's what happened. I think we, showed, we both showed God our plans and God probably had a nice laugh. And after Ronnie left my room, I continued praying. I told, Lord, this is, I, I'm, uh, you know, my, my grades are pretty decent. I'm signed up to do the MCAT. I'm volunteering at the hospital. This could be a good thing, but it might not be your thing. Maybe you have something else in store for me to do. And so I prayed that prayer that night, not knowing what would happen. And the next day I woke up and I had zero desire to go to med school. Now, what's interesting is that Ronnie prayed the same prayer. And so as soon as Ronnie got back to Canada, he went to seminary. And he ended up getting his PhD in the New Testament. And then Ronnie and I connected last summer. And he now is a religious studies professor at Samford University in Alabama. Right. So both of us prayed not knowing what would happen, and we both ended up on these very different routes. He's like somewhere between Baptist and Anglican. That's kind of where he's at. He loves the Anglican church. He loves being Baptist. But his wife doesn't want to be Anglican, so he secretly goes to an Anglican church. So um, great guy. Great guy. And, uh, but we both reconnected. And the funny thing is I asked him, hey, Ronnie, do you remember that time we prayed together? He's like, no. I said, don't you remember, like, you know, we were, we were on this mission trip. You came over to my, to my room, and we prayed. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, we prayed for you. That's why you didn't go to med school. He's like, yeah, I know, but I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, through, 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 through that mission trip, God basically put me on a path to serve him. And, and so when I came back, I decided that God had called me to some form of ministry, and it wasn't med school anymore. I told my parents about that. Um, they were deeply disappointed. Uh, my father, it took my dad around seven years to get over the fact that I wasn't going to go to med school. It was pretty funny because every year he'd ask me, are you planning to go back to med school? I'd be like, no. Well, that ship has sailed, dad. Like, and then the following year, hey, so it's MCAT season. Are you planning to go to med school? <laughs> nope. Nope, not happening, dad. Um, it, it took him about seven years to come around, and what actually made him come around was my grandmother, right? See, my grandmother was a very devout Lutheran, and she said, I've been praying for many years for one of my grandchildren to become a gospel minister. See, like the, the, the U-turns that happen in our lives, we just don't know the different people praying for us, right? I had Ronnie pray in my life. He did not know what was going to happen in his own life. Turns out my grandmother had been praying for many years that one of her grandchildren, she has four, one of her grandchildren will follow the Lord into full-time ministry. And so when my dad found out about that, what's he going to do? Right? He can't disobey my grandmother. And so he basically came around and he said, well, if, if this is what the Lord has called my son to do, then this is what the Lord has called my son to do. And so through, it, was, it was through us uh, doing ministry that I ended up meeting this wonderful and beautiful woman, uh, who is my wife, Naomi. We were both uh, serving in India, uh, in the slums, and uh, we were chatting once, and uh, we, we, I made a, a Dave Chappelle quote. Do you all know who Dave Chappelle is? Yeah. I made a Dave Chappelle quote, no one thought it was funny except her. And so I was like, she thinks that's funny. Yeah. Then we started chatting some more and I realized that she was, her dad was a priest and her grandfather was also a priest. And I told her, well, well I'm thinking of being a priest. And she said, okay, well, uh, let's stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. And so we got to know each other better and eventually we got married. And, uh, and after we got married, she has been an incredibly supportive wife. And, has, uh, you know, she paid for seminary uh, because I was obviously a full-time student, but she was working full-time, so she paid for seminary. Uh, and and, and she was, uh, she's been incredibly supportive along the whole way. 
And along the way as well as when we had more children, oh, by the way, that's a picture of my parents, and that's my dad, and that's my brother and my mom. <clears throat> this is at Emma's baptism at the church that we used to serve at before. Uh, I, I uh, was the celebrant, but she was baptized by our rector, who's a retired bishop. Um, but uh, Naomi and I basically met, we got married, and the Lord also, over the course of time, called her into the priesthood, uh, which is why now we both serve at St. Martin's, serving the Lord both as priests. So all this to say is that, you know, the U-turns that we experience in our life, I that little guy would not have known what the Lord had in store for him at all. And even now, I still don't know what the Lord has in store for me. You know, as our kids get older, as we get older, 30 years from now, I don't know where I'm going to be. But I know that the Lord knows. I know that people have been praying for me throughout my entire life. I know when my grandmother dies and goes to heaven, she'll still be praying for me from heaven. I know that Ronnie's prayers from way back in the day still have some amount of grace that God's still using it, even though it happened so long ago. And I know that, I know that people throughout, the, uh, throughout my life have, have, have sown gospel seed that the Lord continues to use even today. And so I hope that this story was encouraging. I hope that you can see in, in this life story that I shared some themes in your own life as well about how other people have been praying for you throughout the many years of your life, of how other people have been sowing gospel seed in your hearts that the Lord has been using. I can also hope, I hope you can see that whatever U-turns happen in your life, even though it was a surprise to you, hopefully it wasn't a surprise to God. He had all those steps ordained from the very beginning, even before the foundation of the world. He already had our lives, purposes, and directions planned out. And I hope that you can take encouragement in that as well. Thank you.